Today I'm covering a whiskey that really needs no introduction. Over here this is Glenmorangie 10 year old and I'm going to be looking a little bit into the history and a few of the interesting facts of this one because I'm a big fan of Glenmorangie. Also, I should probably say it's Glenmorangie, not Glenmorangie. I've made that mistake myself, don't worry, I'm not judging. In fact, I'll probably do it in this video at some point. Do you want down? You're not a fan of whiskey? No, okay. Farewell, Momo. May we meet again. Now, I'll kick off by saying that this is very much a standard expression. It's a 10-year-old, it is coloured, it is chill-filtered, it is 40%. So, why has it got my attention so much? Well, for that, there's more of a behind-the-scenes kind of a thing, which... It's certainly admirable when it comes to quality control. So the distillery is located in Tain, which is in the Highlands, and it has the notable distinction of having the tallest stills in all of Scotland. For base to tip, it is 26 feet and one quarter inches. Now, the idea behind this is that only the purest vapours are able to get that tall, so you end up with a cleaner, higher quality product overall. But what's really caught my attention with these is their approach to cask management, or as they have been known to call it wood management. Stop giggling. Oak is a critical ingredient in how whiskey is made, and it kind of seems obvious, really. It's an alcohol made with wood maturation, so obviously the wood is going to be a core component of that. But Glenmorangie Accredited is one of the first ones to really look at how wood influences the whiskey and the different kinds of wood, the different kinds of oak, how the oak grows, where the oak grows, and really look into that and have a look at the kind of influence that that has on the whiskey. And for, through various conclusions that they've come to, they have a signature style, which is their starting point, which is where we get the 10-year-old, or the original, as it's been known since 2007. Glenmorangie use American white oak from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri. Now, it's a slow-growth timber, and as a consequence of that, it contains more slow growth from spring. Now, the wood is then air-dried, as opposed to kiln-dried, which does two things. One, it reduces the astringency in the wood, and second, it makes it even more porous. Now, once they've made their casks, they get shipped off, and they're used for maturing bourbon for four years. They then get the casks back, and they use the casks a grand total of two times, which is a little bit unusual. Most distilleries will use the casks as much as they can, because they want to try and get the most return for value, essentially, and they can mix it with newer stuff, and, you know, they can they can get around any issues. The reason Glenmorangie don't do that is for the simple fact that it's kind of like if you try and make six cups of tea all with the same tea bag. The first two, you're going to be like, okay, they're passable, and after that you'd be like, it's not right. It's not It's not right. Um, you get less flavour with each fill, basically. So the more times you use the wood, the less usable it is, basically. Uh, and Glenmorangie are just like, nah, two, and that's done. And they probably sell it off to another distillery to give less of a fuck about that thing. So, you know, they're still quids in at the end of the day. I don't know if they do do that for a fact, but, you know. Um, one of the people that's been the backbone of this distillery has been a man called Dr. Bill Lumsden. If you know much about whiskey, you might have at least heard the name. So there was a story that I looked up about him on the Glenmorangie website. In 1984, he was a doctoral student for, I'm going to have to read this out because I'll never remember it, Microbial Physiology and Fermentation Science, that's a tongue twister isn't it, at Edinburgh University. And in 1984 he was in his second year and he was at a party in Marchmont, which is sort of the, the nice bit a bit further down the road from me. I don't live in Marchmont. I wish I did. And at this party, there was music playing and all the rest of it, you know, and they were doing young stuff, you know, like... And he was handed a glass of whiskey, and he was told, you know, drink this whiskey. Being a Scotsman, he drank whiskey before, but it had been, you know, blends and uninspired stuff, so he wasn't mad excited for the stuff. And he tried it, and he fell in love with it. And it turned out that that whiskey was, in fact, odd, oh, but no, it wasn't. It was Glenmorangie, because of course it was fucking Glenmorangie. It'd be really funny, wouldn't it, if it was something else, because you're like, where was that story going? So like, oh, he just, just quite liked a whiskey, and then many years later he needed a job and he went to Glenmorangie. That's not the story. Um, he did end up in Glenmorangie. He ended up there in 1995, and he's been with them ever since. And he's kind of considered sort of the, the core man of Glenmorangie. Um, I mentioned as well in 2007 that the 10-year-old changed a little bit. Um, they changed it from being the Glenmorangie 10 year to the Glenmorangie original. It's still got the age statement on the front, so it's not that much of a difference. And they went over to air drying uh, their wood. So, you know, some 
mild differences um, compared to the whiskey that he would have originally tried. Um, there was also a mention in that story that he would try stuff at the Jolly Judge, which is a pub that I don't think I've ever been in, but I've been told I should really check out some point. So obviously 2020 is the ideal year for that. Anyway, um, that's all the facts. Um, that was difficult for me to get through because I don't normally do stri uh, stricted. Fucking Nora. I can't talk when I'm trying to do scripted content. It doesn't work for me, does it? I thought I'd give it a go and it's, it's kind of been a car crash. I'd imagine this is just going to be jump cut, jump cut, jump cut, jump cut. And you'll be like, what's he doing? What's going on? He's, he, stick to the improv, John. You're better at it. Anyway, there's some Glenmorangie in here. I'm going to nose it and drink it now. I'm going to stick to the... I'm going to stick to the thing that I'm good at, which is putting whiskey in my face. So... Getting like lots of ripe fruit notes, so kind of like cantaloupe, melon, green apples. They're like Concord grapes in there as well. There's a little bit of like honey kind of dancing around in the background as well. But yeah, for me, it's, it's mainly, it's very fruity on the nose. It's a really, really fresh and inviting kind of a nose. I've heard um, many other people talk about Glenmorangie 10 and say that it's, it's kind of a bit schizophrenic. It changes depending on the day that you're nosing it, the day that you're tasting it. There seems to be wild variations in people's ability to pick out particular notes on particular days. And there could be many reasons for that, you know, maybe humidity makes a difference to what you can get out of a whiskey on a particular day. Maybe it's not just unique to this whiskey, but I think because it's such a, a common requested whiskey, you're gonna notice it with this kind of a whiskey more often is my theory. I don't know. I'm making stuff up now. I don't know if you can tell. You can tell. A little bit of like brioche notes, but yeah, it's it's a very fruity nose, this one. Um, to sample it, kind of like, I mean, it's an explosion of flavour. It really is. Um, it's quite, it's a little bit tannic. It's fresh fruit, so like kiwis, red currants, blackberries. But then there's like a buttery pastry kind of a thing, and like fresh cream. There's like a richness to it, and a, a velvety kind of an aspect to it, but there's also this fresh fruit, a little bit of sourness, a little bit of tartness, a little bit of bitterness. There's a lot going on. There's like a, a back note of vanilla, and the flavour's lingering as well. Which, it, it, quite impressive, to be honest. Yeah, there's kind of like a, a brioche toast and like fresh fruit kind of a thing going on. Gets a little more like stewed, kind of like a, a compote kind of a thing towards the finish. And then it gets a bit more vanilla-y. There's a slightly nutty aspect to it as well, like walnuts. A little bit of like pistachio in there as well. It's, a, it's really rich, but fresh, fruity, but... Also a little bit more kind of like luxurious. It's it's really, there's a hell of a lot going on. I'm gonna try it with a bit of water now to see if any differences make themselves known. Do -do. Oh. On the nose it's got a little more biscuity, kind of like uh, rich tea and kind of like wafer cone, kind of like vanilla-y, slightly, it's almost like a, a weird kind of like caramelly bitterness to wafer cones sometimes. You know, you know what I mean? Like if, you know, they've been a bit overdone, that kind of a, kind of an aroma. Fresh fruits are still coming through. Um, apples, pears, oh, like blackcurrant as well. Something a little bit richer in there. Just smells kind of purple. I, I don't know if there's many uh, synesthetics out there, but you know, sometimes you just kind of like associate a smell with a color. That's kind of what I'm getting right now. It's not helpful, but I know what I mean. So it's difficult for me to do this because the cat is down there at the minute and he's being all kinds of cute right now. It's it's really distracting. Oh, that belly. Oh, he's buggered off. Never mind. Right, drink the whiskey. He's abandoned you. Gentle. There's much more of the softer notes coming through now. It's much more kind of like vanilla ice cream almost. A little like if you've been cooking with butter as well, kind of like, you know, you'd... If you made an omelette, you know, that kind of like cooked butter taste that you get on the outside sometimes. The fruit components kind of go away a little bit, but rather than becoming leaner, it gets richer, which is a little unusual. There's like a, a dry malt thing as well. 
the flavour, it's got the flavour of sweet things. But the flavour you get is dry. It doesn't make a lot of sense, I know, but it's, it, it's, it's difficult to describe sometimes. You, you sometimes get it where it reminds you of a confectionery, but it doesn't taste sweet. It's difficult to explain, and maybe I'm just not making any sense at all, but I, I know what I'm meaning myself. Oh god, he's back and he's being so cute. Sorry. Math feels gone a little bit thinner, but obviously it's, it's had some water to it now. But yeah, much more mellow, rich, a little bit more luxurious. It's a cracking dram, it really is. Um, it's around about this time of year, people kind of like start asking me, you know, what's, what's good on the market? You know, what can I get that's not going to break the bank? There's, to be fair, there's loads of options. Um, but I would say, you know, if you, if you just kind of like, you know, need to like dash to the supermarket and get something, you can't go far wrong with Glen Moe. There's, there's... It's just good, you know, they just, there's there's a, a passion and a craftsmanship to it which is getting to be a little more absent in a lot of the more readily available whiskies. so it's nice to still have one where you can just be like, that's a good go-to. Anyway, um, let me know down below, what are your thoughts on Glamorangy? Have you been pronouncing it Glamorangy? Like pretty much everyone else until you eventually do get corrected. It's actually a friend of mine um, about 10, 12 years ago originally corrected me because he loved this stuff. Uh, it was his like absolute go-to whiskey and I, I get it. I totally get it. Um, it would be fascinating to be able to try this side by side with the whiskey that Dr. Lumsden would have been trying at that party in 84. Luckily, we can do that in the future. Uh, this is an 80s bottling of Glenmorangie 10 year old. So we get to step into the past. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to get the update for when I publish this. It is a comparison I'm looking forward to doing and it's going to be fun. For now though, I'll say thank you very much for joining us. Oh no! Come here, come here, say goodbye to the people, come on. Or just go back to sleep, okay. For now, though, I'll say thank you very much for joining us, and do join us next time, where I'll be drinking something else.